Good afternoon, everybody. It's a humid, sleepy afternoon, and I hope not to put you all to sleep with uh, these three very smart writers with me. I don't think that's going to be possible. And uh, you know, I'm, once in a while, I'd like to lapse into Malayalam because it seems to be a presence of Kerala right here. Um, perhaps, you know, just in a while, a couple of sentences in Malayalam. So, um, writings in Kerala, I mean, in English about Kerala and writers from Kerala, it, they have not been studied that much in academics, but we have had a lot of coverage about this uh, in the last one decade because uh, we are getting a lot of writers from Kerala writing in English. And uh, Anita has been one of the pioneers of it. I can remember only the name of um, Molly Daniels before that, who wrote about, uh, I mean, Ramanujan's wife, Molly Daniels. Uh, she wrote a diaspora story based here. And of course, uh, Arundhati Roy came in um, about your time? Later, a little later, uh, a little earlier, okay. So uh, Anita has uh, not only touched uh, fiction, she has gone across a number of genres. She's written poetry, she's written scripts, I think, yes. And uh, she's written travelogues, she's written uh, children's literature, short fiction. And I think I'll spend the next 10 minutes talking about that. <laughs> I'll just sum it up in saying she's uh, gone across genres and established herself in all the genres. And uh, then I come to Manu. Manu has uh, created a Malgudi for us, and so has Anjana. And Manu has been ahead of Anjana. Uh, it took Anjana to get uh, locked up in Trishu during COVID to find her Malgudi. But uh, Manu has done that a little before, and he has created a uh, couple of stories, I mean, he's, he's written, um, the, um, the first one is The Town Has Laughed, that town, Savitri special stories, The Town That Laughed, The Oracle of Karatupura, and the new one, yeah. Okay, I'll leave you to talk about that. So that uh, we have two Malgudi specialists, but I wouldn't give it the, or the entire credit to R.K. Narayan because our Malgudis are special in other ways. So let's uh, talk about how and why writing happens from Kerala and in Kerala and why they chose to write in English rather than in other languages. So over to you. So my first question is how your writing started, not generally as writers, but your writing about Kerala started. So uh, Anita, can you go first? Um, good afternoon. Uh, in, in my case, of course, you know, I I mean, to also answer another question that you had put, which was basically why, why don't uh, I write in Kerala along with the others, is basically I haven't studied Malayalam. I grew up outside Kerala and um, I went to one of these Kendre Vidyalayas. So because of that, I, my second language was Hindi. And until I was um, in class eight, even my social studies was in Hindi. So um, that was my second language and Malayalam was the fourth language because the third language was sans Sanskrit. So, but, so Malayalam was something that I spoke and when I was growing up I didn't speak it as well as I do now. But uh, much later I think um, once my parents returned back to Kerala and started living here and then I began to spend more time in Kerala on a routine basis rather than just coming for vacations. Uh, my speaking Malayalam improved and now I mean I, I have a feeling sometimes that I speak more pure Malayalam than a lot of people do in Kerala now because it's not adulterated with English at all and uh, for me this whole business of writing about Kerala began because I asked myself and because my father was in a transferable job um, I really never put down roots anywhere and the place that I imagined myself putting down roots in was Kerala. So for me, uh, when, I, when my parents moved back to Kerala, it seemed like um, finally like having come home. And I knew everything about, over the years, you know, I knew everything about the landscape. I, you know, started making inroads into understanding how people uh, in Kerala think, what is it that excites them, what is it that they hate, you know, all the little, uh, the emotional manscape, mindscape, I was mapping it out. And, uh, and then there's something about um, Kerala for me, and especially my part of Kerala, which is um, 
a small village uh, tucked between Palakkad and Malapuram district, where I, I feel like this is the center of the universe for me, right? So ev when I'm there, I feel that everything that I know come, kind of acquires a flourish. And so the first novel that I wanted to write, I, it, it wasn't even planned in that fashion. I, uh, uh, my parents had decided that they wanted to go uh, away from Kerala, move out and etc. And they wanted to sell our ancestral property. So I thought that I would just kind of chronicle the village so that, you know, when my son and nephews are older and if they asked where we came from, I would just give them this book and say, here, this is where we came from. But I started writing and a chapter down, I said, forget the chronicle, I'm writing a novel. And that was how I started writing about Kerala. And Manu, I think you took the chronicle a little ahead. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, for a place to become magic in your head, uh, you have to be removed from it. So uh, Kerala is magic to me. I mean, it may not be for you because you live in this wonderful place. But I have been like Anita. I have also been, uh, I was uh, brought up outside largely. So I used to come here uh, on holidays only. Uh, so, and I would come to uh, my pa grandparents' home. Uh, on my dad's side, it was uh, Pandalam, and mother's side, it was a small village called Cherupoiga. So I used to come here, and everything here was uh, strange and removed for me. So m maybe that has stayed in my head. This was my childhood. Uh, and later, again, I never sat down and thought, I'll write. Okay, it just came one day, uh, I wanted to create something about that place. Uh, of my childhood, Cherupoika village. And I wrote my first uh, short story. It was called The Cold. The Cold, it is uh, the first story in my uh, first collection. It's about an accountant called Kunyumon who uh, suddenly gets this attack of uh, you know, charity. He wants to do charity. But then he's unable to do it because uh, he's an accountant and he keeps keeping tabs on what to pay, uh, how much to pay for what he's going to uh, buy for somebody. All that, and then he ends up not doing the charity at all. So that was the story, and I had sent it to a magazine, uh, Caravan magazine. They published it. But after that, Harper Collins uh, reached out to me, uh, asking me uh, if you have more such stories, we can maybe uh, publish as a book. That is when, frankly, I thought about uh, uh, books and all that. So I'm an ad guy, so I've, I've written nothing more than headlines. So. <laughs> But then uh, I was kind of motivated with that. Uh, Harper Collins is asking me, and then I wrote. But the, it was a discovery to see that there's more, st more story there for in my head. So I went on creating characters. It was a little later that I realized that these are all people that uh, you know I've interacted with in my childhood, and the place was also from childhood. So that is why uh, I, I take so much pleasure in writing about that uh, land. So I think uh, when you're removed from a place, that is when you really yearn and uh, create stories in your head. So it is like, uh, you be careful how you deal with me or I'll put you in my book sort of thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, kind of. <laughs> so Anjana, I think uh, you traveled ahead into the world quite a bit and then came back to write about Kerala. Uh, tell us your experience. So I guess I'm the third um, outsider looking in. Um, it's kind of a mixture of the experiences that uh, both of them have had with Manu and Anita. So I grew up in Delhi and for me again, Kerala was just um, a holiday destination where I'd come for my school holidays. I think mostly because my mother didn't want to deal with me through the year and she wanted to escape me for two months. So she'd send me here and I'd spend time with my grandparents. And so I've never really lived in Kerala. Which part of Kerala? Trishu. And um, of course, my adult life, I went away and worked in London and Singapore and I was out of the country for a long time. And then COVID happened and, um, you know, my parents were kind of moaning about being left alone and nobody around and um, kids who don't care, um, which is not entirely true. So I decided to pacify them and come to Kerala. And um, I think it, it was the complete opposite of Delhi, um, which is where I grew up, which is quite an aggressive city. And, um, you know, Delhi is a city where... Um, I think power weighs the city down. It works very differently. It doesn't work at a community level like Kerala. So for me, coming, um, coming home, being stuck in a room, 
in my parents' house on a separate floor, having zero interaction with them, because this was the early days of COVID where people assume that if you stare really hard into someone's eye for another 10 seconds, they'll catch COVID, right? So um, I was pretty much trapped in my room. And, uh, but I did have companionship on the phone. I had the Kerala government throughout. They were calling me, checking on me. I would have health workers check on me. The cops would ask me to come and wave from the balcony. And this was actually quite shocking for me. Because in I think Delhi, you're kind of left alone. And um, you know, you're one less person to care for. And that's great. Um, so I started chronicling that kind of in a funny way on my Facebook. And after three or four posts, um, I have to say here that my Facebook posts are not popular at all. I'm not a popular person. Um, I had people WhatsApping me, people I hadn't heard from, and people outside of India as well saying, why haven't you written? It's already 11 o'clock. What's your update for today? And then I realized that there is an appetite for it. And then um, you know, a friend called and said, can you just stop wasting your time on Facebook? This is really hilarious and funny. And it's true. And why don't you keep it as a journal and then see if it can be a book? Um, and I think I half kept it as a journal because I've, I've been a writer, business writer all my life. And you kind of have this little vain hope that you might become an author one day. So I think I was pandering to my vanity when I kept it as a journal. and then. Um, after I'd done about 15,000 words or so, I sent it to HarperCollins, and um, they said it's a book, um, which was both you know, a pleasant surprise and a little bit of a shock. And then, of course, I wrote about um, life after the 30 days, because it was 14 days in a room and another 14 days in the house. And then I wrote about the town and the people, and um, I think it's my discovery of Kerala um, as someone who wants to belong, and I, I'm trying to kind of, I think, find my identity. Because in Delhi, you're um, the proverbial madrasi, you don't belong. Um, in London, you are, um, you're Asian, but you're not British Asian. And in Singapore, you're Indian, but you're not a Singaporean Indian. So I think there's always been a struggle to fit in. And I think in Kerala, for me, it was, um, you know, Ivarna Lale. The first thing people would say to me is, Kuti Ivarna Ivarna Lalo. So, you know, it was again trying to fit in, and that's how the book happened. Okay. Um, Anita, uh, the very first book I remember when I see your name is The Lady's Coupe. I loved it when I read it first. I still love I think it's the book I like best. The second comes Eating Wasps. So, those two books have a connection, right? And uh, is there anything about Kerala that is. Uh, that made you write that particular uh, duo of books? Uh, Ladies Coupe, it had nothing to do with Kerala. Mm -hmm. It was entirely set in Tamil Nadu and the characters were drawn from uh, Tamil Nadu. But Eating Wasps is very definitely set in Kerala. It's set, I go back to, so I've been like uh, chronicling my part of Kerala, which is what I was telling you, Shornur and mm -hmm. the surrounding areas. So um, <clears throat> in Mistress, I'd created this uh, resort uh, called Near the Nila, which is on the banks of Bharatapura. But there is a resort of some sort there called the River Retreat. So um, I'd use that place in my mind. I mean, created a fictitious place, but you know, the idea that there could be a resort by the river. And so I had mistress uh, set in that area. But so when I wanted to write Eating Wasps, I was like, where do I set it? And I said, I already have this location that I've created. So it was like many of the characters who are there in uh, Mistress appear in Eating Wasps as well. And it is a Kerala novel in many ways because it's also the central character in it who is a ghost is based very, very loosely on this writer from this very famous writer, Raja Lakshmi. Right, very loosely based on her because all I had was um, <clears throat> an obituary notice that had come out uh, when she passed away. Um, someone had found access to it for me from the archives and given it to me. So I read that. And then I'd read all her books. And, uh, it, and using that as my skeletal frame, 
I built this character for uh, Raja Lakshmi and she's called Sri Lakshmi here. But it follows her life trajectory in a, in a very kind of, um, um, again, very loose fashion because like um, Raja Lakshmi did study in um, Banaras University. Sri Lakshmi also goes to Banaras University and then she comes back and works as a college uh, uh, lecturer. Um, there is a point, I think, where she actually works in Pandalam. And uh, so, you know, it's like a fleeting reference to it, but she then finally is in NSS Otapalam, which is where uh, Rajalakshmi also was, you know. And yeah, but that's, that's the only connection to Rajalakshmi. But the character itself was formed based on what my reading of Rajalakshmi's books were. So uh, maybe it's not the truth, maybe it is, I don't know, but that was the character I created. And so she is um, a, a huge part of that novel. And she's the one who is like uh, the narrator in many ways, uh, the one who links the stories. There are different women's stories there and links the stories one after the other. So um, I think in that sense, my more solid Kerala novels are uh, Mistress, and uh, Idris, because that's very, very ingrained uh, into that region. And it's kind of steeped in the lore of that area, which is the Valluvanad, uh, yes. you know, frame of mind, Valluvanad persona, all of that. And it's very steeped in that. And it's, it's drawn from a lot of um, personal anecdotes that I've heard within my family and so on. I think I'll talk to you about separately requires yeah, okay. attention. Manu, um, how much of Karthupura uh, is fiction? There is uh, no such place, of course. Yeah, <laughs> but it's obviously a yeah, built-up name. Yeah, yeah but uh, it's very much modeled on my grandparents' uh, village of Cherupoiga. Yeah. Cherupoiga is a little pond. And Karthupura is a river that turns dark after uh, uh, towards evening because the shadow of the hills nearby fall on the waters so uh, in fact there was a river there where the shadows used to fall <laughs> i mean there is still <laughs> so uh, yes it is very very much modeled on uh, a place but the people and the the uh, description of the uh, uh, land is all uh, my own it's all uh, imagined okay and uh, anjana how much of it is fiction and how much is uh, your contribution? I mean, um, real. No, it's your Malgudi. Yeah, you know, it's all real. All it's the all. characters are um, absolutely real. Um, a lot of them are still around. Okay. Um, and I really just, um, I think all I was doing was observing them and putting a bit of distance between myself and them. And um, also, I think it was possible because it was a very peculiar time in history where there wasn't really much happening. And everyone came under the magnifying lens. Um, you know, just a trip to the supermarket was like an adventure. And so each morning was a new adventure and a new discovery. And so all the characters and everything, even chronologically, it's tr the narrative is true to events as they happened. Okay, so I, I think you would realize now that you are into, uh, you're getting into a genre like partition fiction or uh, uh, what do you say? War fiction? I know it's COVID fiction. Well, <laughs> I hope, you know, we're not going to see another, rather, another bout fiction. of it. But um, I, I wouldn't have written the book had I not been stuck um, in a particular place. So and time. is this your only book? No, I've written another business book, which okay. came out before this, um, published by Penguin, on storytelling, but business storytelling. Okay. Uh, Manu, um, when you approached, uh, I mean, Caravan approached you for the stories, you said you had uh, some of it written. So how difficult was it you know, to write naturally and then to write more? How many characters did you have to include again? Did you have to bring in more characters? I'm talking about writing Kerala into your uh, upcoming book. Uh, it wasn't difficult. Sup I was surprised. Because uh, I had no clue that I could <laughs> keep it up, you know. <laughs> so I had written one story. I don't know where that came from. 
uh that's when uh, harper asked me uh, in fact caravan caravan themselves wrote to me and said do you have any more stories if if you want uh, i mean if you have we would like love to publish uh, another so i wrote a second story uh in uh, caravan that is when uh, harper approached but even then I, i had no idea that i would be able to really write more along the same lines with in the same setting so uh but uh, once i got going it was uh, it it was very spontaneous it started flowing out and that is when i realized that i'm drawing from the past from my uh, childhood hello yeah. but you have characters yeah. which you have repeated yes. and you have brought in new you have left out a few yes. right yes. Yes. so um, are you trying to i mean i saw this these books all of the books are social satire more than you know malgudi so can you answer that did you mean to have social satire or did it just seep in because you have a ad ground background see uh, so satire is a very strong word uh, i do i never intended uh, at least initially to satirize any any practice or any any person uh, it's more like uh, i was i i I, fa- i find people funny i find situations funny and i'm really humored and that's all I, that i wanted to convey but i did end up uh, talking about uh, people's you know uh, idiosyncrasies and uh, silliness at times so it, it yeah it uh, finally accumulatively uh, what i write is satire but no I, it was not intended initially now now i'm intending <laughs> anything new coming up yes i'm working on a novel now i have uh, changed gears in fact you know uh, up until now the, the, the four books that i've written were something in advance and putting down a plot and all that and i'm trying to write more in a tighter manner okay anita your um, eating was i think came up around uh, did it have anything to do with nirbhaya that time no it had nothing to do with nirbhaya but um, it came around the time when i think um, i you know i'd written lady scoopay which was published in 2001 and uh, I was asking myself like okay it's almost two decades now I mean it was I started writing the book uh, in I think about 2016 and it was published in 2018 and um I has has anything changed at all and then I realized nothing much has changed it's, it's ex- except that the extraneous circumstances were very different um uh, I mean in the sense that a woman could imagine that she had freedom or emancipation because all these words had been kind of bandied around so much but did she really know what it is to be a free woman you know in that sense um so i was trying to again explore that and uh, yeah so <laughs> sadly i don't think there's any, anything that's changed much nothing actually yeah. um i think you moved on to crime fiction after that No, no i started to see the thing is you know when when you're a full time writer like the way mm-hmm. i am and i don't do anything else you know i mean i don't have a, a parallel career so what happens is i need to make my writing interesting for me when if i were to write a uh, literary fiction on and on and on it is going to get repetitive not mm-hmm. just for the reader but even for me as the writer so i then decided that the crime was a, a whim really it was a whim i I didn't even read crime fiction until I started you know after I finished it's only then I started reading crime fiction. So a uh, crime happened and it and I realized that crime couldn't be set in Kerala for me because Kerala for me was my literary fiction landscape whereas crime I needed to it to be a city and uh, I, I live in uh, in Bangalore and uh, in a in a what used to be once a quiet part of Bangalore I see one of my neighbors here and uh, and uh, yeah and it's changed a lot but so crime then is wonderful when uh, when a city is on the cusp or an area is on the cusp of change because that's when new things happen and crime I think actually works wonderfully in that kind of a setting um it becomes more edgy it becomes more darker and all of that see when you all are creating worlds you know like you have done 
uh, I mean, your village is already out there as a character. Like uh, both of you have created villages into characters. So how much, what all do you look into, into creating this? You know, there are things you like, there are things you dislike. How much of it do you dilute? How much of it do you add? I'd like all, of, all three of you to answer that. So uh, I think the way I look at it is that it's a, a microcosmic world that I'm creating, um, which is basically that I'm looking at everything that I like about the world and everything that I dislike about the world and try and uh, weave some of that into this fictitious place that I create, uh, which is what I did with uh, Kaikurushi, which is basically, again, a takeoff on the village that I come from. Uh, but with uh, the, the difference is that with Bangalore, I didn't have to do that. It was as if the world presented itself to me, and I and and, and the, it was a re, you know a, a character that was already born, and I just needed to see how I could use use this character to enhance the narrative. Manu. Yeah. Well, in my case, uh, I think uh, the place uh, that I write about is a reaction to my immediate reality. I mean, <laughs> not that I dislike Bangalore or uh, uh, but the the. the something about urban life itself i mean maybe whichever city uh, life is always a rush right you're running around and uh, heat and dust and uh, crowds everywhere traffic and stuff so uh, this is a kind of an escape for me so i, I create a place that is uh, on the other side of a mist so to speak you know so uh, for example uh, i feel you could never have uh, uh, the wizard in uh, any other place than Oz. It, <laughs> he can't be located in New York City. Right? So similarly, I, I like to go away from uh, my immediate uh, surroundings. But that's what gives me, uh, uh, that's what gives me the refreshing uh, feeling, sense of after, you know, when I write. So because of that, uh, I think it is, it comes spontaneously to me. Once I uh, live in Bangalore, it's just the other side is naturally there. Um, so I think for me, it was really uh, a portraiture of the people and the characters. And through that, um, it kind of expanded into what is this place about? How does the rest of Kerala fit in with this character? And what does this character tell me about the character of Kerala? Or what makes it unique? Um, and a lot of the characters in the book um, are universal, and not because I'm saying that, but because readers wrote in saying, um, you know, you've got this drunk caretaker. You know, there was a similar character in my grandmother's house, or um, even a town, a small town in the north. There were people who called and said, this particular shopkeeper that you wrote about, we have, you know, we had a similar one when we were growing up. And for a lot of people, it was also, uh, I think, nostalgia, because I did capture some of my own childhood memories in the book. Um, not that I set out to do that on purpose. It was just that when I was writing about something or a particular character, you know, I had this flash of something that had happened when I was a child. Um, and so I tried to bring that in. And mostly I would say, for me, the town develops around the people. See, when I... Um when I look at uh, other books by writers uh, coming from Kerala in English, um, I've seen that Mridula Koshi's books, uh, she's done a lot about, uh, she's put that background in Kerala. Again, uh, Tanya James, she's put in one book entirely in North Balabar about elephant, elephant hunting and elephant man conflict. And, uh, but what I saw was, you know, when you put your heart and your character and your world in Kerala, um, now the translations are big. How would these sound in translation in Malayalam? I'm not talking about other languages. I believe, Manu, uh, we had a conversation of this sort. And I also need to say when Deepa Gunnikrishnan's book came out, Temporary People, and uh, I took on the translation for a while, then I found that, you know, when he was using uh, Malayalam within English, and as a, you know, like he's using it as a metaphor uh, to get things into place. So when he says kada in English, it sounds very, you know, like it's just in place. But if I translate it into Malayalam, I mean, people may start asking, what is so great about this? What is so great about saying downstairs there was a kada? I mean, even we say that. Okay. So, uh, what, did you, what do you think? How much of uh, you're placing it in Kerala and giving it a Kerala life, a Kerala uh, personality? How does that affect 
your possibilities of translations into your mother tongue? Um, yeah, sure. um, so, I think um, one of the challenges that I've found with um, other books that have been translated where I can read the other language, say for example, Hindi, is that two things typically happen. When you do a literal translation, you kind of um, lose the language, the original language. And if the translator tries to bring in the lyricism or the craft of the writer, then it ceases to be what the writer um, wrote. So I, I think it's actually quite a challenging thing. People sort of, you know, have a habit of saying, oh, it's just translated. But I think the translator's job is far more challenging than the writer's job because you have to kind of go into the writer's head and get their tone and at the same time not sacrifice um, you know, the, the authenticity of the original language. Um, I'd love for the book to be translated, but... Um, okay. Now, I gave you a very tough example. Deepa Kunikshan's book is uh, quite different from what you usually see in fiction. And we don't have the Gulf diaspora uh, portrayed in this manner. I mean, there, uh, other than Good Days, there aren't many books which uh, talk about Keralaites in the Gulf and people who are invisible, those uh, labor, laborer people, and it's not about the white collar jobs. So it's very difficult. Their life is portrayed in such craft. It's, it's a very difficult translate. I gave it up finally. So, um, uh, Manu. Yeah, uh, see, I, in my case, I don't, I don't tell myself uh, that I'm presenting Kerala to the world, to the, to the non-Kerala world. I, 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 I don't feel that way. I'm not really, I think even if it's uh, translated into Malayalam, it will hold because uh, the things that I, the descriptions are just a prop. What I'm really doing is exploring character, uh, which I think will remain relevant. So if I'm uh, describing a color shop, <laughs> toddy shop in Kerala, uh, I think the way I describe it would be interesting to the Malayali as well. Because I'm talking about things that he frequents the place maybe, but then he's going to see that uh, what I'm looking at is very different, you know, in the sense, uh, for example, I've said somewhere that uh, the tables in a color shop, uh, are the wooden tables, the, the wood seems to be marinated in all the fumes of that place. So um, a, a Malayali can also read that and, and uh, maybe appreciate it even more. <laughs> so, so it's not just that there's a table. Uh, you, you, you know what I mean, right? So that way, I think uh, if you keep the description uh, deeper than the obvious, uh, translations uh, will, will not suddenly make it go flat. Yeah, but the translator's job is very important. It is tougher than the most, I think. Yes. Anita? Um, so all my work has been translated into Malayalam. In fact, I have two uh, books that is only published in Malayalam because it was a set of travelogues that I used to write for Yatra magazine. And then it was collected into two uh, travelogues. Um, one was called uh, Kuku Kuku Tiwandi, and the other one was Kake Kake Kude Bide, which is drawn from the nursery rhymes pretty much. And these were uh, travelogues. And so, one of the things that I've done consistently over the last several years is that um, I actually read the translation. I read Malayalam, I read the translation, and I tweak it when I think it's not working. So, I, and since I don't know the script, I will write it in English. I know the word. And one of the things that I notice is that when I'm writing about Valluvanad and Kerala, the, the words are very different. So uh, a translator who's from the south of Kerala would say vial, and we don't say vial, we'll say padam. You know, so all those little details, I would change that. And so I work quite extensively on my Malayalam translation because that's the only language I can work extensively on uh, in the sense that I, it's a deep-rooted understanding of the culture, the way words are used and all of that, even the, the dialect. I need to ensure that the dialect is representative of the place that it is from and not representative of another district of Kerala. So um, it is a, it's, it's much more difficult than actually writing the book myself because then I, I, I have to kind of scrutinize it very, very carefully. Um, yeah, and then I did this uh, translation from um, Malayalam to English when I did Chemin. And that presented another set of challenges. So I, in some sense, you know, managed to uh, see it from the translator's point of view and from the writer's point of view. And that experience has continued even when I'm uh, reading the translations of my work. OK. 
Okay. Now, since you mentioned, um, um, no, I'll come to that later. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, um, Anita, just uh, take this conversation forward. How much of uh, how much have you written where you don't have Kerala in it? Okay. Sorry to do this count. But um, there's ladies' coupe. No, the first uh, there's ladies' coupe. There's lessons in forgetting. Um, there is alphabet soup for lovers and the two Gauda novels. Um, so that's five and a collection of short stories, uh, which is not set in Kerala. It could be set anywhere. Your poetry? Uh, poetry has some of Kerala, but not all of Kerala. You know um, uh, the. Yeah, so I would still think that one of the strongest uh, elements in my writing is the presence of Kerala. Okay. Manu? Uh, my latest uh, collection of stories, uh, many of the stories are not set in Karatupura or Kerala. Okay. In fact, there, is, I think the, uh, there are a couple of stories that are set in, an, uh, in a city, though I'm not naming the city. Uh, but I think uh, changing settings like that uh, is nice, it is refreshing and a writer must reinvent himself. So that's why I'm trying that. But the next thing, the one I'm working on right now, I fall right back into <laughs> Kerala. Yeah, so okay. maybe an addiction, I don't know. Okay. Uh, Anjana, since uh, you're just uh, into fiction or creative non-fiction, uh, there's just uh, one book here. Yeah, there's but uh, what are your plans? Um, I don't know if I have another book on Kerala mm -hmm. because I think um, the first, in the first book I had um, distance and uh, since I've written the book I've kind of um, spent more time in Kerala and I think some of the things that you, um, that you can see when you encounter it the first time um, are very different when you're used to it. It's, it's like he said, you know, like Manu said, if you go into a color shop, would you sort of observe what the table is like? And would, he would probably observe it maybe the second time. But for me, I think I would observe it the first time. The second time would be a little more of a challenge. And then it loses its, um, you know, what you call the outside eye. Mm. 